From the studios of KENW on the campus of Eastern New Mexico University, it's You Should Know, featuring the people and events of Eastern New Mexico and West Texas. Welcome to the show. With me now are Drs. Manuel Varela and Dr. Michael Shaughnessy, and uh, they have written a book, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, could you tell us, uh, Manny, could you tell us the, the name of the book, please? Uh, the name of the book is um, The uh, Inventions and Discoveries of the World's Most Famous Scientists. Okay, and uh, what got you interested in in talking about scientists. What? Well, it turns out that during lectures in my courses, I often like to mention who the discoverers are of the scientific concepts I'm teaching. So I'll mention the scientists' names, I'll mention their experiments, what they, why they did them, what kind of data they got, uh, what it means, and why it's important for us today, and why they would need to know it. Uh, so I think it provides a, a context for them to to, for, for incentive to, to, to study. Okay. <clears throat> and Dr. Shaughnessy, the book has an interesting way of doing, of presenting this information. Um, you actually interview Dr. Barella. Uh, right. Tell me about that and, and why you do it that way. Well, we were at a meeting and we were just discussing some of the commonalities about science. Uh, for example, this morning I got up, I had some orange juice, which mm -hmm. has vitamin C, and I had an orange, vitamin C again, and I was thinking about Linus Pauling. <laughs> now, I don't know very much about Linus Pauling, but this gentleman does, so mm -hmm. I was able to kind of interview him, ask him a little bit about Linus Pauling. Where was he born? What was his education like? What were the trials and tribulations that he had to endure? And what brought about his investigation into vitamin C. Very good, very good. And so uh, now let's talk a little about process because there may be some people out there actually want to write a book. Uh -huh. uh, uh, do you record this and then have it typed or do you sit there, talk to Manny and type out what he... <laughs> well, we've talked a lot and discussed a lot yeah. about various yeah. scientists like Walter Reed and mm -hmm. Marie Curie and uh, a number of other people. But basically what we want to get a hold of is the person's uh, biography, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of semi-autobiographical mm -hmm. about the scientists, where they were born, what kind of family they came uh, from. For example, Marie Curie, she's obviously from Europe. So mm -hmm. we need to know a little bit about the context of her childhood or education or upbringing and then what led her into radiology and actually years ago I was fortunate enough to talk um, in Europe and be uh, at Marie Curie's laboratory and to see some of what uh, she had done there and some of the uh, issues that she had with uh, radiation and discovering something that's used almost every day in almost every hospital the x-ray machine to look inside the human body which is one of the greatest discoveries you know, of all time, I think. It's, mm -hmm. you know, relative as to what's important. Um, there obviously have been a number of other important um, discoveries like pasteurization. But pasteurization came from a guy named Louis Pasteur that Dr. Brella knows a lot much more about than I do. So mm -hmm. I would send him some questions via email and ask him a little bit about what he knew about uh, some of these scientists and their upbringing and their education and some have actually gone on to win the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. Which is a most prestigious honor. So um, And actually in some instances uh, Dr. Varela has actually met some of these individuals in person here in New Mexico mm -hmm. And maybe he'll share with us a little bit about that in a bit. Okay, great. Well it, uh, Dr. Varela uh, it, the students, I know, must be interested in this, I would think, because they, they would like to know uh, they want to be scientists. That's why they're taking your class. And they'd like to know what kinds of personalities and, and those sorts of things or problems and things they had. And, and since we've talked about Marie Curie, uh, did she ever have any problems with the radioactivity that she worked with? I often thought of that myself while I was studying that in, in high school. Yes, yeah, she did. Um, and since she was 
probably the, one of the very first people to have worked with radiation in a concentrated manner. Uh, basically, she discovered radiation. And her element was radium, and then later on, polonium. And unknown to them at the time, it was toxic to them, but they hadn't known that. Mm -hmm. So their clothes, their laboratory equipment, their materials they brought home, their, her cookbook and her kitchen are all radioactive. And so that uh, historians believe that uh, ultimately that's what led to her uh, untimely uh, death at an, at, an, at an early age. Um, it, um, if, if you want to study her materials, her laboratory notes and her, um, her, her artifacts, uh, you have to, uh, well, they, they were decontaminated, but they're still toxic. <laughs> and so mm. you have to wear shielding and, mm. and gloves and protect yourself from the, from the effects of the radiation. We probably ought to point out that uh, as X-ray was developed, uh, they've cut the amount of radiation way down. They've done many things to protect the patients. Um, it's still not a good idea to go you know, get 200 X-rays or things like that. But uh, they've really cut back so that it's not it's not a dangerous process to get an X-ray. That's correct. Uh, what you want to do is minimize the exposure time maximize the shielding effects uh, so that you can uh, reduce your dosage of the, of the radiation uh, to, to, to the body so that you don't succumb to any uh, uh, detrimental effects like cancer, or what she had is a fatal anemia. Um, mm. She also had other problems too. Um, she had um, harsh laboratory conditions they had to, they, they, they brought in trucks, raw materials that they had to boil and pour uh, uh, concentrated acids and, and other chemicals into mm -hmm. just to extract the, the radiation. Um, and that was work and it wasn't air conditioned, it wasn't heated. <laughs> it was an old um, a shack. <laughs> it, was, it was literally a shack. And, um, um, and yet she, she, she persevered in, in overcoming all of those uh, obstacles to ultimately uh, publish her work and, and um, win the Nobel and publish the, um, her, her, her data for the others could read it and uh, um, um, bring the, the, the field of physics and, and chemistry forward for mm -hmm. others to, to, to work um, on and and study and, and 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 build upon. That's a great that 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 that, that is a great story, um, <clears throat> Michael. Yeah. Um, you have to be interested in all of this. Why? I mean, well, I, I tell my students, okay, uh -huh. that if you're going to interview people, you have to be interested in things. <laughs> yeah. well, you know. Tell me about it. Like I said, I got up this morning. I had some oranges, but I also use Listerine. Now almost every morning I use Listerine which is an antiseptic and I began to wonder well this product it's pervasive it's worldwide people are gargling with this Listerine but who invented Listerine? Where did it come from? And it does turn out that there was some individual named Joseph Lister. Now I didn't know very much about Joseph Lister who invented Listerine but I was able to ask Dr. Varela a little bit about Lister and his life. Very good. Yeah, Tell um, us a little about Lister. That's, I, I had no idea Listerine was named after a man. Very good. It was. Uh, Joseph Lister was a surgeon who was uh, concerned about uh, post-operative infections. And in his time, that was considered normal. And if you survived it, that, that was great. But more, more often than not, you, you didn't. And that was considered a, a, a normal pr part of the process. Um, he um, decided to uh, spray in the amphitheater of the of surgical theaters the, uh, a substance, a chemical known as carbolic acid, that he thought would reduce the, the numbers of microbes floating around and in 
um, wound um, uh, uh, wounds that were started uh, surgically. He also applied the carbolic acid to open uh, surgical wounds to prevent the microbes from making an infection. And he uh, succeeded in um, uh, reducing the, the mortalities and, and post-operative infection frequencies uh, and other, other um, uh, uh, doctors picked it up, uh, although it took a war to do it. Uh, there was a war between the, uh, the Germans and the, and the, and the, and the French, the, uh, the, um, uh, the so-called Prussian-Austrian War that the soldiers and, and doctors uh, in those wars wanted to re reduce the, the effects of, of, the, uh, of, of, of dying from infection during, for, from, from the battle wounds. And so those doctors picked it up and, 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 and practiced the um, art of listerism, um, applying the, the antiseptics to the um, infected tissue or to tissue from, from bullet wounds or, you know, um, shrapnel wounds. Uh, and they, they were able to, to, to bring their, their, their soldiers back to health and, and you know, send them back to, to the lines. Um, in the U.S., uh, it, it took a bit longer. Uh, the um, assassination of um, President James A. Garfield, mm. um, his bullet wound was infected, presumably by, by Dr. Bliss, who was poking around with his, with his <laughs> fingers and instruments. <laughs> and he, he died from the, the infection. Um, and uh, even then, Listerism wasn't really picked up until um, a, uh, a professor at Johns Hopkins says, well, I think I, this is what I heard they do in Europe, so let's, let's try it here, too, and that's, we've been doing it ever since. Uh, but Lister's been, uh, he, he's, he's been receiving a, a accolades for, for many years, the naming of Listerine due to him. There's a bacterium, Listeria monocytogenes, named after him. If you get the disease, you get Listeriosis. Uh, there's um, um, a mold named after him. Uh, a Listerella, and mm. uh, there's an institute, uh, of Lister Institute, uh, dedicated to the study of bacteriology and antisepsis. So mm. he's he's um, he started up the whole the whole. It, w when you have an operation, you don't die because of Listerism. Very good, very good. Um, Michael, there are literally thousands of scientists right. in this world. Um, how did you go about picking which ones you wanted written about and in the inventions and the, and the things that they had worked on? Well, while we were talking, I kind of reflected back to my high school days when you took biology and chemistry and a number of other courses. And certain people just kind of jump out at you in, in your memory that you remember some biology teacher talking about, for example, Gregor Mendel mm -hmm. and the peas. But I didn't know very much about Gregor Mendel other than he was a monk. Um, so I, again, turned to Dr. Brilla to ask him a little bit about the life, the history, um, and what brought about this whole thing that really started genetics. Am I in incorrect here? Or? You, are totally, you, are, you are totally correct. Uh, his, um, um, Gregor Mendel's uh, entry into the study of, of what he, he, he basically invented genetics started with a failure. He failed his natural sciences courses in college, and he couldn't be a teacher. So they mm -hmm. sent him uh, to, to, to school to learn the natural sciences. And while he was there, he learned uh, horticulture techniques. He learned um, um, agriculture techniques. Uh, he learned how to plant uh, peas and, and other uh, plants. And when he, when he came back home, he started uh, working with the peas and corn and other plants and started um, uh, asking questions about what made these traits that they had uh, come about. And uh, he used mathematics to do it. And mm. unfortunately for him, uh, when he presented his data, he talked about the mathematics and to, to a bunch of botanists and they, they <coughs> had a hard time uh, <laughs> understanding him. So um, he published the work and then uh, nobody read it for about 30, 40 years until it was rediscovered. Um, and then it took off from there, Mendelian genetics. And mm -hmm. because of that, uh, we, we can now 
do so many things with, with uh, genetics and DNA and biotechnology and make products that you and I might want or need or use for diagnostics or um, uh, gene therapy or um, uh, CRISPR is, an, is another technique used to modify uh, genes in, in, in an organism to correct it or to fix it or to, or to modulate it in some way. And so everybody benefits from these inventions and, and discoveries of these uh, scientists that Dr. Shaughnessy studied when he was a, a child. And, and we use these things in the schools even today. For example, a microscope mm -hmm. or a Petri dish. I, I remember mm -hmm. very clearly in college using those Petri dishes on and on and on, over and over and over, and experiment mm -hmm. after experiment. But I never really knew, well, who invented this Petri dish? Where did this come from? Mm -hmm. Richard Julius Petrie <laughs> discovered the Petri dish. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Well, I was good. Okay. Uh, now I want to ask you about that. Um, are your students interested in that? Do they ask you, uh, well, who, who came up with this idea? Uh, do they ever, ever do that before you have a chance to even bring that up for them? I'm not so sure. Um, I think they just want to get the material down and, and you know, do well on their tests and, and, and get into medical school, veterinary school, uh, dental school, graduate school. They want to go to the workplace. They, they are, uh, th there's a few who are genuinely interested in it. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm totally um, interested in it. If I hadn't have been a professor of biology, uh, I would have certainly been a historian because <laughs> I love, um, you know, the history part of it. Well, tell me, <clears throat> yeah, you you talk in the book about some of these people that you met personally. Um, tell me, give me a story about someone you, that you met personally, and uh, and you've you've given us some of that information in your book. I met several. Uh, let's see, Dr. Sidney Altman, uh, Nobel laureate. Mm -hmm. um, his discovery is uh, that of the so-called ribozyme the idea that RNA can act like an enzyme. And before th his discovery, um, it was believed that the proteins were the enzymes. Uh, but it turns out that RNA makes three-dimensional structures that make them act like a, like a catalyst and they can, they, they, uh, uh, can do uh, a chemistry. And that was his discovery. And it was my job as a young professor to pick him up from the airport in Albuquerque, the Sunport in Albuquerque, and take him to a scientific conference in Taos. Mm. So I, I, I picked him up, had a, uh, a, a, an extremely uh, pleasant conversation with him. You know, what do you say to a Nobel laureate for three hours, two hours <laughs> I, in, in a car? <laughs> now, the whole time I was worried that I would say something that would make him think ill of me. Uh, but luckily for, for us, we found some common interests. He likes books and he likes history. Um, uh, we were reading the same book, in fact. I think he'd read it before I did. We were reading a book about Hans Krebs, another scientist uh, featured in our book. Um, now, um, it was written by a colleague that uh, he knew at Yale, uh, Frederick Holmes, wrote a two-volume um, uh, discourse on Krebs's discovery of the Krebs cycle. And so we were talking about that, and he gave me advice on how to, you know, uh, make my career go better and how to, uh, um, he said, don't be afraid to, to study new and different things for your research. And I, I took that advice and it turned out to be uh, wonderful. Um, we, we, uh, we get to Taos and um, um, he, he told me that, um, uh, you know, let, let, let's keep in touch. And I watched him give his, his seminar that night <laughs> and it was just a, a real joy to meet, you know, to have access to someone so so famous uh, for so such a long time <laughs> very good very good it <clears throat> it's, it's good to be a student sometimes you, you get <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and young it, it, it's very helpful um, I want to I want to ask about um, one of the names on on the list uh, Walter Reed because I, I've heard of Walter Reed Hospital mm -hmm. Walter Reed this Walter Reed and I, I have no idea what Walter Reed did. So would you, would the two sense, of you tell me that? It's a little bit yeah. of a history lesson embedded in there. They were yeah. building the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. 
as I recall. Ah. There were problems with people getting sick, dying, mosquitoes, insects, bacteria, virus. But Walter Reed apparently came up with some solutions. He did. Um, he found out that the uh, yellow fever, which was uh, running amok in the workers building the Panama Canal and others, uh, were, were succumbing to the, to, the, uh, to the yellow fever. And his job was to figure out how, what, what caused the yellow fever so they could stop it. And his big discovery was that it was the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were transmitting the yellow fever. Now, he wasn't the first to come up with this idea. It was a Carlos uh, Finlay in Cuba who came up with it, and he published mm -hmm. a small paper on it, but it was Walter Reed who did the experiments to, to test that idea in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, a controlled fashion. Um, but he asked for volunteers to be bitten with uh, you know, uh, yellow fever-laden mosquitoes, and they, they readily did it. Mm. Uh, the, the, the military <laughs> GIs readily did it. Um, and uh, he talks about how in their, in, in their, in their hospital beds, their, their faces were yellow from, from the yellow fever. You turn mm -hmm. yellow when you get the fever. And uh, because of that, we're able to, you know, uh, make, make attempts to control the, um, the, the transmission of the yellow fever virus to, to others by mosquito control. I want to ask you an, another question about two guys who are my heroes uh, because I, I happen to think they probably saved my life. Um, when I was a third grader in elementary school, there was a big polio outbreak uh -huh. in, in New York State. They also yeah. had it here. They had it all over the country. But uh, Salk and Sabin, uh, what were those two fellows like? Uh, they were both um, Americans, I believe. One yes. was born in New Jersey, one was born in New York, and uh, they knew of each other. They met each other in scientific, scientific conferences, and they were both um, um, wanting to develop a vaccine for the polio because it was devastating populations, and countless numbers of, of people every year. And they both came up with a, with a vaccine. Uh, Sabin came up with a, an attenuated uh, form of the polio, and Saul came up with a, a heat, or a, a, a killed version of the, of the polio, and both worked. Uh, but the problem with them is that they didn't like each other. <laughs> so they kept, <laughs> uh, they kept uh, bad mouthing each other in, in public and in, in writing, and, and when uh, one of them died, their, their students picked up the mantra and, and kept the argument going, and, well, the argument's still going. <laughs> goodness, so, so, goodness. But it's, it's uh, helping us to eradicate <laughs> polio. Eventually, we'll eradicate polio. That's the next disease that's slated for eradication. We're, we're hoping that'll happen soon. Soon. It, yes. it, it was a tremendous thing for them to have done that. Okay, I, I want to ask you, to, to kind of wrap this thing up, Michael, mm -hmm. um, how do you go about getting a book published? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's a, sometimes a long, arduous <laughs> process. In fact, I often say that the first is the most difficult. Um, but there are many, many companies out there. Uh, it's a matter of matching uh, the brilliance, so to speak, of Dr. Brella with the publisher and the company. And sometimes they'll ask for a few uh, chapters. They'll want to review it. They'll look mm -hmm. at the quality of writing. They'll look at the organization, the structure. And uh, sometimes it helps if you have a kind of previous record. So sometimes it's a formula that works. Sometimes it's chance, luck. Uh, you just kind of have to experiment and look around. We're actually looking for another publisher right now because we're doing another book on mm. microbiologists. Wow. So we're going <laughs> from the biology level to the microbiology level. And I think it'll be a successful endeavor. Okay, well, that, you know, this, this, this is just fascinating. Tell me where we can uh, get a copy of this. Well, obviously online, everything nowadays, you just type in um, the name of the publisher, which is Nova, N-O-V-A, Publisher, and they're located in uh, New York. Mm -hmm. So we're fortunate enough to have a <coughs> New York publisher, and if anyone wants to uh, even, even email me about a sp specific scientist that we may have covered, I can give them a link to a um, place where the interview that I did with Dr. Brill was originally published online on Education Views. Very good, very good. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Frolla, 
we sometimes hear your kind of coursework referred to as the hard stuff. <laughs> but but it's not hard, is it? It's it's an exciting thing to learn, don't you think? It may be somewhat hard, but I think it's also interesting. And I think if you find it interesting, it's not hard. It's not hard. It's um, mm -hmm. if you find it fascinating. And this is why I like to talk about the scientists, because if, if it fascinates people, then I think they have a more of, a, of an interest in it. And you're in a field that if if one studies this field, they, job finding is much easier. Than oh yes, absolutely. And you know, it, it, it improves you as a person to know the, the science behind many aspects of our lives. Like uh, Dr. Shaughnessy mentioned Pasteur um, and pasteurization, everything, or uh, not everything, but uh, many things, foods and drinks that we consume are pasteurized. Very and these good. are scientists that make make things happen for us and our, to our our own everyday lives. And keep us healthy and happy. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Well, speaking of keeping us healthy and happy, we I, 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 I want to thank you for talking with me about the book. I hope that a lot of people out there uh, will get a copy of it and read it. And I want to thank the two of you. Uh, both of you have spent a lot of time at Eastern New Mexico University. This is a fine school. I know that your students do well when they graduate, and we appreciate your spending your lifetime here working with those students and helping them. Well, thank you for having us. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> thank You're you welcome. very much. Thank you.